I'd like to welcome you to today's Congressional Biomedical Research Caucus. Um, I'm Joan Goldberg. I'm Executive Director of the American Society for Cell Biology. Um, these caucuses, as many, as many of you know, are possible only with the support of the caucus co-chairs, um, Representative Brian Bilbray from California, Representative Mike Castle from Delaware, Representative Jackie Spear from California, and Representative Rush Holt from New Jersey. And I want to thank them and their staff for their commitment and assistance. I also want to acknowledge the Howard Hughes Medical Institute for its support of the caucuses through a generous grant and the other members and staff of the Coalition for the Life Sciences, ASCB, my group is one, um, the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, uh, HHMI, and the Genetic Society of America, and CLS Director Lynn Marquis, who many of you have worked with, who was here a second ago, who helps plan these. Um, we videotape every briefing, so you can find past briefings on the CLS website at www.coalitionforlifesciences.org. Um, you can also register for the RSS feed um, to be alerted to future postings. Um, today's speaker is Ann Partridge, MD, MPH. She's clinical director of the Breast Oncology Center at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. She's also assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. She's going to address today the mammography, the mammography controversy, uh, redox, because we know we've been here before. Um, over 40,000 American women die of breast cancer each year. Hundreds of thousands more die worldwide. While the death rate has dropped modestly due to earlier detection and treatment gains, the controversy remains about how often people should have mammograms um, and the utility. What is the appropriate guideline for a mammography for women of all ages? What are the data underlying the recent U.S. Preventative Service Services Task Force recommendations for breast cancer screening? And what are the limitations of the research and what are the future research directions? Before turning the podium over to Dr. Partridge to address these questions, I'd like to just share her background. She's Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. She's a medical oncologist and clinical director, as I mentioned. Um, she's not just affiliated with uh, the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, but also with Brigham and Women's Hospital. She founded and directs the program for young women with breast cancer at Dana-Farber. And she's also published several manuscripts and chapters related to breast cancer care and survivorship issues. She lectures nationally and internationally. She's a member of the American Society of Clinical Oncology's Survivorship Task Force, Fertility Preservation Guidelines Committee, and Health Services Committee. She's also co-chair of the Cancer and Leukemia Group's Committee on Advocacy, Research, Communication, and Ethics, and vice chair of its Cancer Control and Health Outcomes Committee. Um, she's been uh, received awards and grants for her research, um, several from ASCO, also from the Lance Armstrong Foundation Cancer uh, Survi Survivorship Award, I should say specifically. Another award was the Tracy Starr Breast Cancer Research Fund Award um, and an ASCO Career Development Award. She graduated from Georgetown University nearby, earned her MD at Cornell, trained in internal medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and she completed her hematology and medical oncology fellowships at Dana-Farber. She also has a master's degree in public health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Partridge. Thanks. It's a real true pleasure to be here this afternoon in your hot city. Um, and to talk about this issue just to get things hotter. I think, you know, I'm not crazy, and I know this is a very controversial issue for many uh, women. It's political. It's emotional. I take care of breast cancer survivors, as you heard. Uh, I'm just a clinical doc who does some research, and I will tell you that this is one of the most emotional issues, for, especially for women who have survived the disease. So what I'd like to do this after, and for women who are at risk for the disease, which is basically any woman who hasn't had the disease and has breasts. And so what I'd like to do today is try and focus on the science, on the data, and I'll go through that, and also to focus on what we need to do to move forward and to try and uh, remedy the discourse. So as you heard from Joan Goldberg, there have been modest but real decreases in breast cancer mortality, which have been attributed primarily to improvements in early detection, that is mammographic screening primarily, and treatment, of course. And yet, over 40,000 women a, a year die of breast cancer in this country alone. It's within this context that we need to discuss this and think about the optimal approach, both for an individual woman as well as to guide pu public policy. 
So first, I'm going to talk about the actual task force, force recommendations and the data that inform them. We'll discuss the limitations of the research criticisms, as well as areas of controversy, and then some future directions. Uh, I think just again, to set the stage, every three woman, minutes, a woman in the United States is diagnosed with breast cancer. There are over 180,000 women diagnosed annually here. 67,000 women are diagnosed with non-invasive breast cancer, often called DCIS. And again, over 40,000 women die of breast cancer each year. That's a lot of women. And that's in part why this is such an emotional issue. Breast cancer death rates have decreased overall by 2.3% per year uh, and 3.3% per year for women uh, in the very young age group. And this, again, has been attributed to early detection as well as more effective therapy. And I would add that these are the questions that every woman who is moving into the age of need, thinking about screening uh, needs to deal with, needs to face. When should I start screening? How often should I have it? At what age can I stop? And what else should I do or not do? What's been shown to help me? So let's just step back and say, when is screening effective to screen or not to screen? Well, first of all, you have to always weigh the risks and the benefits, the costs and the harms uh, versus the, the goods. So benefits of screening for any kind of uh, life-threatening illness, you want it to decrease mortality. You want it to decrease morbidity, that is, feeling ill and people suffering during the time they're alive. These things can vary with the test itself, and that has to do with the sensitivity of the test. That's how well the test picks up disease if it's there. It also has to do with how often you look. It also has to do with the population that you're thinking about. Of course, disease prevalence varies in different populations. And that, in particular, is clear when it comes to the risk of breast cancer by age, and I'll speak more about that. And then it also has to do with the disease biology. So not all breast cancer is the same, and there are very important differences for different types of breast cancer that can occur. And it's important to, that we consider when you think about screening, well, what's, you know, depending on the type of breast cancer a woman might get, not that we can tell that before they get it, but the time from when a woman may have preclinical, that is screen detected cancer to clinical detected cancer, and therefore the effect of early detection on that outcome. If the horse is out of the barn, proverbially, when the cancer is detected with a mammogram anyway, meaning you're going to treat them earlier and they're still not going to be cured of their cancer, that's, this is the, obviously the most extreme, then what is the value necessarily of having early detected or if they're not going to be uh, living with it for longer? The cost of screening also has to be considered. And here, I'm not going to focus a lot on costs, like true fiscal costs. I'm going to focus more on harms today, but of course you can't ignore fiscal, uh, fiscal costs. So the cost itself, but also the morbidity. How much does the test and what the test leads to in this particular situation hurt people and, and diminish their quality of life? There are false positives that occur in breast cancer. That's biopsies, extra imaging, and what does that lead to? It leads to anxiety, extra tests, rare medical problems like punctured lungs, things like that when you have to get a biopsy. It's rare, but it happens. There's also the issue in breast cancer of overdiagnosis. And what that means is diagnosing, diagnosing something that a woman otherwise wouldn't necessarily need to be treated, and we'll talk more about that later. And of course, these harms or costs vary with the test itself, which is the actual cost of the test, but also the specificity of the test. That is, in contrast to sensitivity, does it pick up disease if it's there? Specificity is, if it says it's disease, is it really disease? Is it going to be picked up? And then screening interval also plays into that. How often do we need to look and how accurate is it and how long can you wait between intervals? Um, it also has to do with the population. So if you have a population of people where the risk of a disease or the prevalence of a disease is quite low, then you're going to be looking for needles in haystacks. And it, the cost and therefore the morbidity of the tests may go up in comparison to the benefits. So also to set the context, because mostly what we're going to focus on as we move on in this talk is the big part of the, the task force recommendations, which were changes for women age 40 to 49, 
we need to understand what the prevalence of breast cancer is in the population of women we're considering. So this shows you the age-specific age risk of developing breast cancer. And you can see here that, you know, by age 30, it's about 1 in 2,000. And then, then it goes up to the 1 in 8 or 12 percent of women over a lifetime will get breast cancer. That's not a small number, but you can see the dramatic increases as a woman ages um, and much more modest risks when women, in her, women are in their 30s and 40s. So it, last November, the uh, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, funded by AHRQ, predominantly uh, set forth to review the world's literature on mammographic screening in particular, but breast cancer screening in general, meaning not just mammography, and redid their, uh, their recommendations that had been done previously in 2002 and prior. And when they went to look at the data, they had an analytic framework, which I won't trouble you with all the details, but they, they thought about the benefits of screening mammography, clinical breast exam alone, and then breast self-exam for all ages. And they really focused in terms of the benefits of mammography on the younger women, that is age 40 to 49. Um, and they also, of course, looked at the harms and their goals were to reduce uh, late stage invasive breast cancer and of course reduce breast cancer mortality and total mortality. That's what we want to see and that's what they were looking for. And they had key questions. Does screening mammography, uh, whether or not it's film or digital or MRI, decrease breast cancer mortality, in particular among women age 40 to 49 or over age 70? And then the questions about what else can we do? Clinical breast exam, breast self-exam, does it help? Now, I'm not going to focus on the clinical breast exam and breast self-exam issues today, uh, but I will tell you what they, what, they, um, what they did recommend, and I'm happy to address that further in questions. So that's down here, screening for breast cancer using other methods. Digital mammography and MRI, as well as clinical breast exam, what they found when they reviewed the world's literature was that there just aren't enough data. So the jury is out about the benefits that these modalities can give, and therefore they can't recommend for or against. So evidence insufficient, grade I. When they did review breast self-exam, there actually had been one very, very good study from China and another mediocre study from Russia, which have been conducted randomized trials, which have shown no benefit in terms of breast cancer mortality from a regular routinized breast self-exam. That is, you know, remember the shower cards and everybody goes in the daisy pattern around their breasts once a month. You do it when you pay your bills. And unfortunately, despite our best efforts in unscreened populations where you'd expect it to actually help the most, right, because these populations are not getting mammograms, unfortunately, breast self-exam did not improve outcomes. There were more cancers in general diagnosed, but it didn't improve outcomes. And so what's the take-home message from that? And I think we have to be very, very careful because I think the message and what gets picked up in the press is often examining yourself doesn't help. Don't, don't even bother. And people come to me and say, but I discovered my lump. And everybody says early detection matters. Now, examining yourself on a regular basis, daisy pattern, routinized, is very different than saying, don't even touch yourself or pay attention to any lump or bump that occurs in your breast, right? And so the point that I'm trying to make is that what probably happens is that women in their day-to-day -day lives or their partners, they feel their breasts. It just happens. You shower, you feel your breasts. And that is probably enough compared to regular self-exam so that regular self-exam does not improve upon that. Does that make sense? And that's what's been shown in these unscreened populations. Now, there are some caveats to that. Of course, you know, the average Chinese woman has different risks than the average American woman. And I think that if women want to examine themselves on a regular basis, that's fine. They can. But should we, as physicians and healthcare advocates, tell patients and train patients on how to do it when there's evidence that it doesn't help people necessarily? we probably could spend our money in better ways and our time in better ways. So I generally recommend not, you know, bury your head in the sand and examining yourself doesn't help, but know your own breasts, know when there are changes and point out any concerning changes to a healthcare provider, especially for younger women where they're not being screened. Because you heard that I do breast cancer in young women. It can and does happen. It's rare. 
but it does happen. So I don't want to send mixed messages here, but does everybody follow what I'm saying? You still want to be aware and point out lumps or bumps that can and do occur. It's just not that common. But what I'd like to do today, now that I've gotten off that part, is focus on the most controversial aspect of the recommendations from 2009. And those were the recommendation against routine screening of average risk women between the ages of 40 and 49. And this is just showing you the differences. So in 2002, uh, and there was a, lots of controversy around these two, what they ultimately came out with was women between 40 and 49 should be screened every one to two years with mammogram. 50 to 74, it's very clear that they should be screened every, every one year or two. Uh, at least that 2002, that's how that was felt, and that's why that wasn't one of the major questions this, this go around. And then this is, there's a caveat here, because what they did was leave it pretty loose. They said 40 and up every one to two years. But when you really look at what they said in the text, they actually, in the evidence, said that after 70, the evidence was insufficient. So they kind of left everything a little loose once you got to 70 and beyond. And they did change that this, this go around. So in 2009, while they peeled back and said no routine screening for 40 to 49, and if you're going to do it, only do it every two years, and we'll talk a lot more about that, <coughs> mammogram every two years for 50 to 74, and we'll talk about the frequency issue in a few minutes. Uh, but they actually, this time, extended this for sure to 74 based on some of the modeling data. So, you know, I think that many of the criticisms, I'm going to try to get not be political here, but many of the criticisms about the task force were that it was about rationing and it was right as Obama was rolling out the health care reform. And one of the things that we pointed out was, you know, yes, this does make things less costly. And I'll show you some of that data if you roll back to less than every year. But they extended it for the 70, 74 year olds to make it to go all the way to 74 based on some of the newer data which I think got lost in all the hullabaloo uh, and the controversy. And I think it's important that, you know, that is one of the largest growing populations in our society is women as they age and women healthier as they age in their early 70s. So what were the new evidence to inform how the task force uh, made these recommendations? Well, there was a new randomized controlled trial, which I'll show you in a minute. There was also longer follow-up of some of the trials, including one in particular that I'll show you. There was reassessment of old data. There was some non-randomized data, which I'll show you. And then there was a modeling study that was contracted uh, at multiple different institutions, including my own in full disclosure, although I had nothing to do with the study itself. Um, the age trial, though, was one of the biggest things that informed this, these data. So the age trial was undertaken beginning in the early 90s and it took 161,000 women in the UK ages 39 to 41 starting out. So it really is the demographic we're talking about. And the women were randomized to mammography until age 48 or usual, usual care. And of course, some of these women still would go and get mammography. So there's always issues of adherence and contamination uh, in these studies. And they were followed for 10 years. And what the AGE trial revealed, just let's cut to the chase, is that there was a reduction in breast cancer mortality that was shown that was approximately 17%. So when you see it, 0.83 in the relative risk, that translates to a 17% reduction. It was not statistically significant. I'm sure many of you know this, but when the, that's the confidence interval. If it crosses one, that means there's not as much confidence that it's statistically significant. So it was a non-statistically significant difference, uh, excuse me, improvement in breast cancer mortality of about 17 percent, and there was no difference in, uh, well, a 3 percent, but really, you know, wider conference intervals for the, such a large study in all-cause mortality. This is not that different than what has been seen in previous studies, including this age group, and this was done to focus on this age group to, due to the complaints that no studies had included enough of these young women in the prior uh, assessments. What they also found, you know, they did find this breast cancer mortality decrease, albeit not significant, was that the number of women needed to screen in order to prevent one breast cancer death uh, over that 10 year period was 2,512 women. Okay? Just information that we know. You want to prevent one death, you got to screen over 2,500 women. 
Now, the other thing that informed was the Gothenburg trial matured. And you can see here that early on, this is, this is the series of trials that first there were seven of them. This is two right here combined in. So there were seven that informed the prior task force recommendations. And then the Gothenburg trial matured and the AIDS trial I just showed you. And the Gothenburg trial previously had been a positive trial, that is, it was statistically significant, the confidence interval doesn't cross one, and there was a reduction for the younger women in terms of uh, breast cancer mortality of about 42%. The latest update, as the trial matured, there was still the reduction, but it was no longer statistically significant. So as the results matured, the benefits went down over time. So this is just a meta-analysis which is how we often tell when we have lots of studies, we put them together and pool the analysis to try and get the sense of the best bang for buck and whether something's worth doing. And you can see here, this is all the women, and this is taking lots of women into account, and this is favoring screening, and this is favoring not screening. And you can see there's a statistically significant tendency towards favoring screening. And this, the number is 0.85 in terms of the relative risk reduction, which translates on the flip side to a 15% decrease in breast cancer mortality that's been seen when you look at all of these studies across the board and put them together uh, from mammography compared to no mammography or you know some, because there's always, again, not adherence. But you can see that you know a lot of them cross that line, meaning they're not statistically significant, the individual trials, some of them did not show a benefit, okay? But when push came to shove and they were put together, there was this 15% relative risk reduction that was found, okay? And then they also looked at what was the number needed to screen or to invite to screen because just like everybody who's not supposed to screen in the control groups can go and get a mammogram outside of the trial and violate the trial and they try and record it, but, but you know, they, they go against what they were recommended to do. Um, some people will not go to screening even though they've been randomized to screening. And so considering all of that, the number needed to invite to screening they found in the youngest group was about 1,900 over a 10-year period in order to save one person from death of breast cancer. That's about 19,000 mammograms, okay? Compare that to women in their 50s where it's about 13,000 mammograms over a 10-year period to save one life. And then much more robust women in their 60s, it's about almost 400 mammograms to save one life, okay? And they don't have the data for the, for the 70s. And so you can see that the obvious differences, so in the younger women, a 15% mortality reduction. In the 50s group, it was about 14% also seen, but because the disease is more prevalent, you, can, uh, you don't have to look as many women to save more women. And in the 60s, it's very clear that the benefits are much greater and they have a reduction that corresponds to a 32% reduction in mortality, okay? So lots of criticism of these studies. And the radiologists, people I work with, people you know, that look at these and they say, this is a travesty. Some of these studies were old technology, garbage in, garbage out. And you, know, you have to be very, very careful because believe, people believe in what they do. And just like patients who've had a mammogram that detected their cancer, they believe that their mammogram saved their lives. They're very invested in kind of, and we've taught them that. We said, oh, good thing you got in. Let's go, let's get your treatment. Here's your chemo. Um, so you have to be very, very careful how we talk about this and also uh, how we analyze it taking into account that there's no perfect science. By definition, once you start measuring something and selecting people to be in studies, you've changed things a little bit. It's not quite the real world. And so what are some of the major criticisms of the trials? Well, one of the things is that the trials may underestimate the benefits of screening. So women who refused screening and died of breast cancer were counted as mortalities in the screen group. So those women who didn't do that. And in the AGE trial, which was that young women's study I showed you in the beginning, 70% of women attended screening, which means 30% didn't. And so, which is really interesting, I think. Like, why did they sign up? I don't know. Um, women allocated to control groups could receive screening outside of the trial. That's the contamination of the control groups. And then the really important thing that our mammographers bring up all the time is that older technology, fewer 
images. They're not using digital, which now subsequently has been shown compared to film mammography to improve visualization and, and reduce callbacks and reduce the harms. And then finally, very important in this country, most of these studies were conducted outside of the United States and minority groups like in most biomedical research in the United States are woefully underrepresented in these data sets. So what are the downsides of mammography screening? Well, I think one of the biggest ones is potential radiation exposure. And it's all potential, right? And when, this, when the task force looked at this, they actually found very little evidence for harm from mammography. That being said, it is a theoretical risk, and we don't have great studies to tell us what those risks are, because you would expect in the natural history that these 10-year screening studies where you have a couple years of follow-up may not tell you the whole story, especially when you're dealing with a very young woman who's going to have 30 years worth of mammograms. We just don't have those data. Um, what about psychological harms? Well, they're real. There's lots of evidence that women do experience significant anxiety surrounding mammograms, in particular if they have a false positive, that is if they get a call back or if they have to have a, a biopsy. Um, it's clear, though, that that doesn't actually change their future screening behavior from the literature that's available, which is interesting. Um, but there are unnecessary imaging that occurs, as well as biopsies of false positive images. And that obviously also has implications for cost, that is fiscal cost. Um, the other major issue, which we deal with all the time when these patients come to us, is we have to be careful because sometimes we know we're treating cancers that would not otherwise have become clinically apparent in a lifetime. Now that becomes much more relevant when you're talking about older women, though because those women are much closer to dying of something else. When you're talking about very young women, women in their 40s, especially if they don't have other medical problems, you know, their life expectancy is quite long. And so that argument to me falls a little bit flat. Like they're probably gonna, something probably was gonna happen with that breast cancer. Um, the other issue is that how much and do you overtreat apparent cancer that wouldn't have shortened a woman's life? Again, more relevant for older women, but still relevant for some young women and of course cost. Um, so let's just step back a little bit, and many of you are probably going, but it's cancer. What, what do you mean, how it's not going to affect someone? And I just said, you know, maybe I disagree with the youngest. Uh, but how can screening have only a limited effect on mortality? Well, screening is successful when precancerous lesions can be detected and eliminated. So again, if the horse is out of the barn, unfortunately, screening doesn't help. And some biology, some tumors are like that. Some tumors, you know, they can be really small, but unfortunately, they've already spread, and they're going to hurt that person in the long run, most likely. Removal of precancerous lesions is accompanied by a significant decrease in the development of cancer. So things like pelvic and pap smears, right? If you, take, if you do a pap smear and you treat precancerous lesions, you markedly decrease the risk of them developing an invasive lesion. Same thing with colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is true cancer prevention. You remove a benign polyp, you decrease that person's risk of developing invasive disease. Screen, breast cancer is a little harder. Screening increases detection of indolent cancers, as we've just alluded to, and that, that's something called length bias. That is, you maybe haven't done someone any good, you detected something earlier, but you, they may not have heard from, from it for a long time, but they still may live the same length or it would have been detected at the same time and not necessarily hurt the person. Uh, there's also the risk of overtreating, and then of course screening often misses the most aggressive tumors. So I cannot tell you how often women come into me and say, I just had my mammogram a few months ago and it was clear, how can this be? And, they, you know, and the scariest thing about screening like that is when people sometimes ignore a breast change, a lump or a bump. They look at it and they say, but my mammogram was okay. It's the false reassurance that can occur from a screening test. And they you know, therefore don't get in when that lump starts growing. Um, and this is particularly true for some of the more aggressive tumors uh, that we see, especially in younger women who are more likely to get more aggressive disease. So stepping back again, one of the most important things, and this is the theme here, is that breast cancer is not one disease. And, therefore, and patients are all individuals. We have to make some guidelines to guide us on how to, to inform patients. But in terms of treatment, we're moving more and more towards a tailored approach to treatment. And what we need to do ultimately is move towards a tailored approach to screening, but we're not quite there yet. 
One of the biggest controversies that exists in breast cancer treatment that has a lot to do with screening and the overtreatment issue I just spoke about is the diagnosis of DCIS, and are we overdiagnosing that? Well, DCIS now represents about 25 to 30 percent of all breast cancer diagnoses. Its incidence has grown up dramatically since there's been widespread screening, and untreated DCIS only progresses to invasive cancer in about half the cases, not even. We're not even sure about it because we don't have a great grip on the natural history. And so currently it's unclear which ones will go on to bad cancer and which ones could be just left alone and might go away on their own. And so we tend to treat these women and that brings up a lot of issues with regard to the screening and the overtreatment. I use that as an example. The other major issue that we worry about, especially for the younger women, is the sensitivity of mammogram. And this depends on both age and breast density. And this is just to show you uh, some older data that in women age 40 to 44, the sensitivity of a mammogram to pick up cancer is there is only about 68%. Whereas if you get to an older woman, it goes up into the 80s. So mammogram is an imperfect test. Cancer can be there, but as you get older, it gets more perfect, whereas the younger women, because of their dense breasts, it's not as good. And then the other major issue is that on the flip side, because of the dense breasts and because of the lumps and bumps that are often benign in younger women that occur, there's also a higher false positive rate from mammogram in our younger patients. And you can see here, this is outcomes per screening per 1,000 women screened at any given screening event. And for women 40 to 49, there are almost 100 women of 1,000 for each screening that will have a false positive. That is, be called back for an extra test or, and fewer to undergo a biopsy. And that goes down to only about 60 as you get into the older women. All right, so, so very different, big differences in terms of the false positive results uh, for the younger patients. They also, for the task force, commissioned groups of researchers to do some modeling studies to try and extend what we know from the randomized trials, which take select populations, and extend them in mathematical models based on the data, and also to think about the community settings and adherence and things like that that are harder to filter out in the trials. And they did some very nice work, and they had six different models from six different places, all using different techniques, and they all kind of found the same thing, which is kind of amazing. Um, and they looked at the two major issues, which was when to start screening and then how often to screen, meaning yearly or every other year. You don't need to read all that. And we're very fond in this business of making those ROC curves, receiver operating curves. You guys probably see this in, in other uh, areas. And this is a curve where where you want to be to maximize the bang for the buck is right about here. Okay, so you want to be paying, doing the fewest tests to get the best mortality reduction. That's kind of the goal in general. Um, but of course, when you're dealing with mortality, you'll do a few extra tests, right? Because it's a, obviously an important outcome. And an intervention is considered more efficient if it results in gains in healthy outcomes, like life years gain or death averted, while consuming fewer resources or causing fewer harms. And what they found in their models, and this is just an example of one of them, was that annual screening from ages 40 to 84 resulted in a modestly higher mortality reduction, but in a much greater, greater risk of false positives and required substantially more resources. And so those are the data. And you can see here, this is broken down, and this will be available on the web. I won't get into all of the details, but you can see that the cancer deaths averted per, per 1,000 women, if you start screening at 40, was modeled to be about six if you start screening at 40 and go all the way up to 70. And if you start screening at 50, it's 5.4. So it's a difference of not quite one, okay? But look at that false positive rate. It goes from 780 if you start at 50 all the way up to 1,250 if you start at 40. So a big difference in terms of uh, harms to patients. Now, the, some of the advocates and the radiologists would argue anxiety is not a harm compared to death from breast cancer, and, and obviously that's a, that's a philosophical and political debate. So what they found was that also screening bien biennially, that is every other year, maintained an average of 81% of the benefit of annual screening with 50% of the false positive results. So it gets you almost as much benefit 
in terms of re mortality reduction at much less anxiety and costs and extra tests. Screening biennially from ages 50 to 69 also resulted in a 16.5 percent reduction in breast cancer deaths. So that's kind of what you've seen across the board. Um, and initiating it, screening at 40, reduced my mortality by an additional 3 percent, but it consumed more resources and yielded more false positive rates. Okay. So let's just step back and talk about the pros and cons for you know a woman who's trying to make a decision with or a patient with their doctor trying to make a decision about mammogram at age 42, let's say. Should, why should she have it based on what we just talked about? Well, breast cancer is the commonest cause of death from any cause in this age group, OK? There are over 8,000 women ages 40 to 50 who die of breast cancer each year. And the meta-analyses that I just showed you, all those studies show a decrease in mortality of up to 15 percent. Some studies are not statistically significant, but overall, in the end, that meta-analysis was. So why shouldn't women have mammogram at this age? Well, there's clearly less benefit, bang for buck, for an individual woman. And there's greater harm when it comes to risk of false positives, risk of uh, biopsies, and emotional and anxiety problems. Women have lower sensitivity of mammogram due to their breast density lower disease incidence, so you're looking more for the needle in the haystack. You're talking about more like a 1 in 2,000 risk or a 1 in 250 risk. Um, and women cancers that women develop when they have breast cancer at a young age tend to be more aggressive, and they tend to have faster double or doubling time. So their disease is different. And therefore, you're less likely to pick it up on an imaging, even if they did have a good mammogram. And they also have lower specificity, which is what I was just saying. And then, of course, the younger you start, the more exposure to the radiation, and the more that theoretical risk of a radiation-induced problem, including a radiation-induced cancer. Are we causing cancers in the breast because we radiate? We know that in women who have therapeutic chest radiation to developing breasts, like, say, for Hodgkin's disease or other lymphomas or victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those women are dramatically at increased risks of developing breast cancer. What is short bursts once a year due to the risk of a young woman over a lifetime. We just don't know. So let's switch to the biennial screening. If I'm going to do my mammogram, whether I'm starting at 40 or 50, depending on what you've decided based on that data, should I do it once a year or should I do it twice a year as an average risk woman? Well, the randomized trials show mortality is decreased with screening every 18 to 33 months versus 12 months. So I didn't show you all these data, but many of those studies weren't yearly. Many of them were every other year. Screening programs in other countries report similar outcomes at 10 years for one versus two years in their population-based studies. And in the screening models that I showed you with that area under the curve, two years maintained 81% of the benefits of one year, and the, the ranges were from 67 percent to 99 percent. And there's a biologic rationale for this. Most breast cancers are actually slow growing, and the fast growing ones would be missed anyway by mammogram. These are just to show you the other guidelines that exist out there in can contrast to the Preventative Services Task Force guidelines. And you can see that the American Cancer Society wants to stick to once a year and says keep doing it in your 40s. Uh, NCCN, which is a cancer group, it's the National Can Comprehensive Cancer Network, of which Dana-Farber is a member in full uh, disclosure, also in the 40s and once a year. The ACP, the American College of Physicians, which their trade magazine published, the Annals of Internal Medicine was the one that published the guidelines. Uh, they believe in what the guidelines have shown, and they say age 50 or over, individualized to 40 to 50, 49, and every one to two years. In Canada, they also are of the same bent, and then there, the who is 50 and above. So what about cost? I said I wasn't going to talk about this too much. It's not my area of expertise, but there have been lots of studies that have looked at this. And clearly, you do fewer tests, it costs less, you know, even when they've weighed the potential morbidity of life saved in terms of cost of treating a woman with advanced breast cancer. And they've done these models, and they've shown that at beginning at 40, if you do it annually, 
your cost is 150 billion, and if you extend it beginning at age 50 for average risk women, risk women, and you do it every other year, you cut that risk by about, I mean, that cost by about a third, so substantial cost savings. So let's get back to our questions that our patients or we face uh, when we make these decisions. Well, when should I start screening? I'm not asking about me, I'm not gonna answer that here. Um, when should I start screening, I think, is a question that we face, and, and the answer is, Certainly one should start thinking about it in one's 40s, but whether any given woman decides to screen, I think I agree with the task force that an informed decision is probably the best one, knowing that yes, there are reductions in mortality. So many women will elect to be screened, and I think that's very, very reasonable in that, in that age category. And what the task force didn't say is you can't be screened. They said they recommend against just kind of the knee jerk, make you feel guilty if you don't screen. What's wrong with you? Why didn't you get in and get your mammogram? There is a lot of that out there in our society. And we need to stop that and allow women to make their own decisions in the moment about what's the best thing for them when it comes to these kinds of screening behaviors where the benefits are not so great or they're fairly modest and there may be harms. How often should I have it? I think that unless a person is high risk, I think every two years probably does make sense given what I've seen. But again, I think that should be the decision between the doctor and the patient. At what age can a woman stop? The guidelines were extended up to the age of 74. I think at 75, we consider it and we individualize for women who either have a risk that from their family or their own experience or have very, very active lives or very healthy. You don't expect them to die of anything else in the next 10 to 15 years. It's reasonable to continue screening. Uh, again, an individual choice because the data are just not there to inform the decision. And then what else should I do? Again, don't ignore your breasts, but regular routinized self-breast exam have shown no benefit against not doing that. So how should we move forward putting all these data together? I think we need to move in the direction of more personalized cancer screening and better risk stratification. I haven't gotten to the details of this, but I keep saying the average risk woman. And then the, my patients come in to me and say, but I was average risk and I got breast cancer. So how, we have to get better from a scientific standpoint at teasing out who's going to get breast cancer, not just what proportion of the population is going to get breast cancer, but figuring out in a more discriminatory way who's more likely to get breast cancer than others beyond the age and family history uh, markers that we have. Then once we can do that, we need to develop and validate risk assessment tools to identify these higher risk patients beyond what we already know and help us to differentiate be between cancers that are going to develop that are treatable and curable and are gonna go away, and cancers that are likely to impact on a woman's mortality. And then finally, we need to do more studies of better screening technologies. There are lots of stuff coming down the pike, tomosynthesis, digital mammography, MRIs in certain populations, and the data are just not there yet to tell us what to do. And then, most important from where I sit, with women that are suffering from breast cancer today, we need to continue to improve our breast cancer treatments and continue to do work so that any benefits gained from screening wouldn't matter anymore because we're so good at treating it that they're all gonna be cured anyway. But for now, I think mammograms are our best tool for breast cancer screening and early detection and that no woman should be denied a mammogram if she or her medical provider deem it's appropriate. So what we need desperately now are better risk, risk assessment methods, specific low-cost screening tools, and improved tailored breast cancer treatment and research to do all of these things. Thank you.